Hello, Spring Hill family. My name is Steve Nethery. I'm the pastor with Spring Hill Baptist Church, and I work with a great staff and many awesome leaders. Our mission statement is to create opportunities to follow Jesus. And in the past uh, several weeks, we have talked about the Easter Sunday and Spring Fest as a part of the top three. But the top three today is going to be about opportunities to follow Jesus, and that is in serving Christ. And so the first thing that I want to share with you is we want to encourage you to serve in and through Spring Hill Baptist Church. That's number one. Number two, uh, we want you to grab one of these cards or you can find this online also. Put me in coach, I'm ready to play. And you can fill out this hard copy card with information. You can scan the QR code and discover more information. You can also visit our website. You can visit our social media spaces and discover there how you can do an assessment, how you can uh, give us some information about yourself, where you might want to plug in and serve. And so the top three is under the umbrella of creating opportunities to follow Jesus. We just want you to serve. So number one, seriously consider serving. Number two, grab one of these cards for yourself or someone else. Number three, scan this QR code or go to our social media page or to our website and discover how you might serve and make a difference in the kingdom of God. All right, good morning everybody. We are glad you're here. My name is Steve Nethery. I'm the pastor here at Spring Hill Baptist Church. I work with a, a fantastic staff, incredible deacons, an awesome ministry leadership team, and the list could go on. We are thankful that you have chosen to be a part of the 9 a.m. in-person worship service. And for those of you who are worshiping online, we're thankful that you're worshiping online today. Today is an exciting day for us because of the worship services, the 9 a.m. and the 1115, and then the Bible studies and children's ministry and youth ministry that, that will take place in between those. But then we're headed in that direction to our Dover Foxcroft Farm for Spring Fest. And we're going to have an awesome time blessing hundreds and hundreds of people in this community. And we do that, by the way, so that we can connect with the community. Connection is very important in Christianity. Relationships are, is what Christianity is about, a relationship with God and a relationship with one another. And we want to connect with you. You can visit with me after the worship service. You can visit with one of these individuals. Feel free to visit with somebody sitting next to you. If you have questions about Spring Hill Baptist Church, we will field those questions. Any question is a fair question uh, because we want to build that relationship with you. Right in the pew is a QR code. You can scan that QR code and that will get you connected to us. You can text the number that's up on the screen, 434-423-5300, and that will get us connected also. If you're interested in children's ministry or youth ministry or adult ministry, or maybe you just want to put connect because you're new and you want to find out a little more about Spring Hill, or put prayer, and we'll be praying for you also. When you do that, you get connected to a real person, and that is very important to us. And then also part of our worship service is us returning to God, how he has blessed us. Did anybody sleep in a nice house last night here? Did anybody drive a halfway decent car here this morning? Did anybody uh, wish that your teenagers were staying with somebody else at this time in their life? I just, I'm just kidding. Look, we, we are a blessed people. Would everybody just please look at me and acknowledge we are a blessed people? And as we are blessed, we return to God and then we then bless other people right here in this area through ministries in Virginia, in the Mid-Atlantic area, and internationally. And this morning we have a guest with us who we pray for, whom we support financially, who's a part of this church, who happens to serve on the other side of the world. Uh, and his name is Bob Munson, and so we are glad to have him with us today where we're going to learn how we, as God works in our lives, we can bless other people. And when you give, you can give online, you can give in person, you can put your offering in a little envelope and drop it in this box. When you give, it makes a difference in people's lives, and people are coming to know Christ, people are growing in Christ, 
and people are being reconciled in relationships. Would you bow your heads with me for a brief word of prayer? Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Church family, that is Psalm chapter 34, verse 3. So this morning, in the videos, in the singing, in the word of God, in the offerings, in the connecting, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Amen. If that doesn't want, to, want you to stand up, well, let's go ahead and stand up even if you don't feel like it or not. No, really, we're glad you're here. Let's start a time of worship, and I think those who were with us at VBS will recognize this.
Do you like to play guessing games? I love to play guessing games, like where you have a jar of jelly beans and you try to guess how many are in the jar. So let's play a guessing game and you can guess how many is in each of the objects. So I'm gonna play a video and it'll have three choices, A, B, or C, and you take your best guess at how many. If you're online, you can put your best guess in the comment section below. Let's play how many. How'd you guys do? Did you get some of those guesses right? Was anybody surprised by that number of people in the world? Eight billion. According to the world population clock, this week the number of people in the world is 8,041,942,048. And right now that number is outdated because every nine seconds a baby is born. And about every 10 seconds, someone dies. So more babies are being born than people who are dying. So our world population is growing. That's a lot of people. Does anybody have a guess about how many people in the world have heard of Jesus or follow him? Any guesses? Well, about 2 billion people have said they heard of Jesus and follow him. And that sounds like a lot of people, right? 2 billion? That's huge. But can you guess how many people have never ever even heard the name of Jesus or that he is the way to everlasting life? About four billion. Yeah, half of the people in the world have never even heard the name of Jesus. So these are huge numbers. So let's take a look at what this actually looks like. Let's break it down so we can all understand. We're gonna use um, little people. Each little person I put up here is going to be 1 billion, okay? So, 4 billion people, 2, 3, 4, have never heard of Jesus, okay? And about 2 billion people have heard of Jesus, but they don't believe in Jesus. And that leaves us with the last two billion people who have at least heard of Jesus and follow him. Out of all of those people, so many haven't had a chance to hear how Jesus can change our life. And did you know that? I mean, that just seems like a lot of people to me who don't know Jesus. And that's where the word missions comes in. The word mission, it can mean different things in different settings, but in our space here at Spring Hill, missions means building relationships with others and introducing them to Jesus. Bob Munson is our speaker today, and Bob and his wife Celia and their family, they serve in the Philippines as missionaries. But what Pastor Bob wants us to know is that all of us are also missionaries because the only way to reach six billion people for Jesus is if we all remember that we are all on mission to introduce people to Jesus. So what does that look like for us at Spring Hill? Does that mean we get to hop on a train, a plane, trains in Ottawa's Vills with the Munsons and head to the Philippines? Maybe, <laughs> that's what the Munson family and the Smith family were called to do. But we don't have to have plane tickets or even be able to drive to tell people about Jesus. There are four billion people in the world who have never even heard his name. And some of them live right here in our community. So no matter your address or your age, you can build relationships right where you are and tell others about Jesus. Your mission field, it might be across the globe like the Smiths and the Munsons, or it could be right across the street. You see, we can make an impact on the billions of people in the world. Let me tell you how. We have 
about two or three hundred people each week who hear the Word of God through Spring Hill, either in, in person or through our online services. So just imagine for a moment if each one of us shared with just one person each week about following Jesus. That's how we can impact the world. So here's your challenge this week. This week, go out and bring hope, share Christ, and impact the world. We'll stand at this time, we'll continue to worship in song.
Let justice roll on like a river Let worship turn into revival Lord, lead us back to Look around you. There's so much work to do. This world is in no condition for us to simply sit back and watch. There is a tangible, desperate need for Jesus. A glimpse of hope in the midst of hopelessness. Jesus experienced this. He saw it firsthand. The need broke his heart and filled him with compassion. He turned to his disciples and said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. This alone should stir our hearts. It's a calling, a calling to make a difference to share the truth of the gospel, to be a light in the darkness, to be the church. It's time for us to look beyond ourselves, to turn our focus to the field, to answer the call and passionately share the love of Jesus. This is our mandate. This is our mission. Are you ready to do the work? Yeah. Well, I was uh, asked to speak on um, Every Christian is a Missionary, but uh, Christy Ferguson already preached that sermon, so um, any questions? <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about some things that definitely overlap with that. I'm going to talk about calling, commission, and the categories of mission. It may sound a little bit like an intro to missions class because I actually don't preach on missions very often. I don't know why. I teach it a lot, but I don't usually preach it. So if it sounds a little bit like a class, and if I give a quiz at the end, I hope you'll be okay with that. You, you will do well, I'm sure. Um, I rarely use the term call of missions. When, we, when we talk, people talk about their calling to missions and that, I don't use the term very often because some people get a weird idea of what that means. Some people think it's going to be some, um, I don't know, uh, Isaiah 6 or Damascus Road sort of event or like, like, they're like, like you've been struck by lightning. I can assure you if you've been struck by lightning, go to the hospital, don't you know, go into missions. But I, I prefer to talk about um, a process or journey uh, to missions. And so I'm going to give um, Celia's and mine a very brief version. Um, the long one would take way too long. Um, as a teenager, I wanted to be a mechanical engineer but I also wanted to serve God in a more full-time capacity, so I was kind of going back and forth on that. So like during the school year, I'd be taking cl classes to work on my degree in engineering. During the summer, I served as a counselor uh, at a Christian summer camp. I uh, did that for five summers. I, I found great joy and purpose in it, but in the end, I did kind of leave all of that with, with a certain amount of uncertainty about what God really wanted to do in my life long term. Uh, Celia, uh, she served God in uh, Norfolk uh, with an evangelism and discipleship organization that focused on Navy personnel at the Norfolk Naval Base. Uh, she found it rewarding, um, but hard to balance with a job as a nurse. And uh, so she decided that she would quit her job, 
uh, go to Moody Bible Institute and train to be a full-time missionary. And she was accepted there. Um, unfortunately, she, to, to go there, she had to sell her townhouse, and at that time, she was unable to sell it, so she did not go. So, like me, she was left kind of uncertain about what God wanted in her life. Since she didn't go to Moody, she got the second best thing, which was me, because we met after that. And um, so we got married. And um, why do you find that funny? Um, but anyway, so in the early years of our marriage, uh, we would sometimes talk about missions because, you know, we're, we're interested in that. And, uh, but uh, a lot of times we said to ourselves, yeah, we really, I think we'll probably go into missions, maybe when the kids are grown up and out of the house, uh, maybe when we're retired. And, you know, there's not, that's not necessarily wrong. I know people that do that. I've met, uh, in the Philippines, I meet people who do that. The first par missions partner when we were in the Philippines was a, was a guy, he, was a, he, he had been in the, in the U.S. Navy, uh, and his wife was a, a nurse, and uh, when they retired, they came to the Philippines and they served in missions for years, and we worked with them for a long time. So it's not wrong, but we also know that that doesn't always work out. Uh, my mom uh, actually went to Nyack Missionary Training College when she was young, planning to be an overseas missionary, but then kind of life got complicated and she wasn't able to go. And then when she was older, um, her health was bad, so she wasn't able to go then either. Um, if uh, God wants us now, it might not be right to tell him, happy to go in 20 years, you know. So Celia tells a story of my coming home from work one day and sitting down with her and saying that I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that I believe that God is leading us to serve him in full-time missions. That, however, was also the bad news, you know, and which... Is very true. It is actually both good and bad. But as we were kind of going through this, we weren't really sure. We were still trying to kind of find our way. And so we kind of did it in steps, little baby steps. Maybe the first one was more like learning more about missions. And we began to read up on missions, the lives of missionaries, talking to missionaries, watching missions videos. We began to get information from mission agencies. Um, we found that the number one reason that people are rejected uh, from the mission field is financial debt. That might not have been the one you were thinking of, but this finances is the number one reason people get turned down. Therefore, we work to pay off our debts and to live on less. Our second step was to prepare for missions. Again, prepare, you, you know, sometimes people think, well, you can't prepare for something if you don't know what you're doing. You actually can, really. Uh, we didn't know where we were going. We didn't even know if we were going, but we figured if we are going, we might go to a place where it's going to be hard, for our, hard to get our ch kids educated. So we, therefore, did homeschooling so that we'd be prepared. Uh, in the end, we went to an area where there were schools, so we didn't have to worry about that. But we didn't know that, so we were preparing for uh, that possibility. We started visiting more unusual restaurants uh, to get ourselves and our kids comfortable with food from all over the world. Uh, we focused more on watching foreign movies and foreign news and less on American movies and American news. Uh, back in 2002, we were already, 2000, we started attending Spring Hill. And in 2002, the pastor of Spring Hill at the time, that was Dan, uh, spoke to us and shared his vision that we would serve God full time either here locally or somewhere else in, in the world. And, um, we had never shared with him our thoughts about that, so it kind of came as a surprise for us to hear that. And, of course, he was out of his mind, obviously. But, but still, uh, we appreciated the support and affirmation. We, we need, you know, we're social beings, you know. Very few of us can fully self-motivate. We kind of need the support, affirmation of others. And so that was a very positive thing. Um, I, I went on a short-term... Uh, mission uh, trip with uh, members of Spring Hill back to Londrina. Yeah, there, hey, yep, exactly. Bill was there too. And uh, it was a good time, a really good time. Uh, my family, we, we planned to do a family missions trip to the Carolinas, but I think there were some health things that came up. I can't remember. Something came up. We weren't able to do that. Uh, around that time, we contacted the IMB, uh, International Mission Board, and actually applied with them. Now, again, we hadn't decided we're doing it yet, but we figured... If we're going to do it, we better have the paperwork already worked out. So we already contacted them, and we were going through the process. They went through the psych test with them. They, 
they really want to make sure you're not crazy, which is, never mind, that, that, that's, that's an ugly topic. But we'll, we'll move forward. The, uh, but things were going fine with that, and we were moving forward with it. Um, but then they kind of slowed things down. They said, well, you know, um, Bob, we, we want to slow things down because we want you to lose weight. Uh, they, said, they said that I'm chubby. And uh, obviously, that's something we've, I've worked out since then, maybe. But, um, but anyway, they slowed things down because of that. And, uh, um, but then, IMB ran out of money, and so they slowed it down for everybody. And so at that time, talking with uh, Pastor Dan at the time, he said, well, hey, if you still want to go, we can, we can support you, which was kind of a very cool thing. Uh, but they did say, but there's a couple things that we really can't work out for you. Okay, first of all, we can't really work out your arrangements overseas. We, you know, we don't have we don't have those connections. Uh, so how can you how will you be able to get a visa to work long term elsewhere or that kind of thing? We can't really do that, and we also really can't take care of the issue of a retirement, which is an important issue. Um, I've known missionaries, retired missionaries, who are uh, very close to destitute because they, they, they weren't supported to a point where they could save up for retirement. And um, there's some ugly stories there, sadly. But fortunately, in our case, I think we were okay with that. First of all, Celia is from the Philippines, and we were starting to think that Philippines was where God really wanted us. And the Philippines had just changed some laws, making it easier for, uh, for us to stay there longer term. Uh, additionally, we found out that there was a school, a seminary, close by where we could be trained in missions, which is an important thing. And because I used to be an engineer and so I used to be a nurse, our, we were better prepared for retirement than, than the typical uh, missionaries. So, um, again, up to this point, we still had not uh, formally accepted the call to missions. Um, and I think that's okay. You know, some people think that it shows a sign of faith just to jump in. I, but I, I am reminded that when it comes, like Jesus would talk about how you, you should count the cost. You should really plan and uh, try to figure out exactly. Because it's easy to say, I trust God. But the question is, can you trust yourself? God is reliable, but you and I, we aren't always reliable. And so we need to figure out who we are and that we see whether we're understanding what God is, is doing appropriately. But it's eventually, after a lot of prayer and discussion, uh, accepted the, we accepted the call, and we were going to go on mission, so I contacted Northrop Grumman and said, I'm quitting, uh, sold our house, and in uh, March of 2004, we flew to the Philippines. Again, trusting God, but not necessarily trusting ourselves, so... So we basically agreed, Sally and I, that if, if things just fall apart, we would still stay for one year, and then we'll come back. But the year finished, and uh, we decided to stay. We thought, well, maybe we'll stay three years, and after three years, we'll, we'll come back. But we stayed. Um, and then on the nine-year point, the 10-year point, the 11-year point, and the 12-year points, we considered the possibility that we were returning at that point in time. Uh, we considered coming back permanently at the 17-year point. Uh, but uh, presently, we are, we've are we just passed the 20-year point, and we'll be flying back to the Philippines in three days. So um, um, next year, we'll see. So what I'm saying is don't focus on the call to missions. Focus on the journey, the process that God is leading you on, um, and uh, share that with others. Uh, explore it with others that are trustworthy. Um, so that's what I think about the call to missions. I want to talk about the um, issues of uh, the categories and the, the commissions to missions. I like to speak of missions in terms of three big picture categories. The first one is that missions is, is uh, serving God where the church is not. Another one is it's serving God where the church has not. And the third one is uh, serving God where the church cannot. So I'm going to kind of work my way through these and what I mean when I say that. 
Uh, first one, missions involves going, serving where the church is not. As uh, Christy said earlier, the gospel has not reached everyone on earth. In fact, not only has the gospel not reached everywhere, the church has not reached everywhere on earth. There are those who have never heard. Additionally, there's a greater number of people that may um, have heard the gospel presented, but not in a way that's understandable to them or culturally resonant. Uh, in some cases, there are no churches around. Well, in others, churches may exist in their neighborhoods, but these churches target people who look, sound, or act different. Uh, people act as missionaries when they go to such people, such settings. And the term we use for that is a pioneer. You are a pioneer in those situations. And what do you do? You evangelize, you baptize, you disciple, you plant churches. Um, now, this doesn't happen as much in the Philippines where, uh, where we're at because there is a large percentage of the population that would describe themselves as Christians. And most of the places in the Philippines, there are churches within range of a jeepney or a tricycle. That doesn't mean I haven't known some missionaries who would be pioneers there. Um, uh, I have a friend who's a retired missionary who was the first to effectively bring the gospel to the uh, Ifagao Antipolo tribe in uh, northern Philippines, a, a few hours from where we live. Uh, we have, and we have friends uh, who are serving, um, in fact, some that were being previously supported by Spring Hill, who are serving in um, some parts of Indonesia where um, there are so few Christians and so few churches and a culture so hostile that they would hold church meetings in private homes in rooms with no windows so that they won't be caught and have their members abused or worse. A larger group of missionaries minister where the church technically is, but is in some sense unavailable, especially people who are marginalized or ignored. Um, Aaron and Emma Smith, of course, they, um, uh, who the church supports, they have worked in the slums or settlements of Manila uh, with informal settlers, um, a group that we would often use the term squatters, but it's, it's really kind of an insulting term. We'll say uh, informal settlers. Uh, Sally and I are presently discipling a group in Caloacan uh, City. That's a tough word to name. Caloacan, uh, Caloacan City. Uh, a group of leaders of a church that also is reaching out to informal settlers and the destitute there. Uh, there are churches nearby, but these churches are unwelcoming uh, because the residents are poor and are viewed as outsiders. But this leads to a second category: missionaries serve where the church has not. You know, mission, missionaries really shouldn't have to plant churches for the poor where there are already churches. Uh, missionaries really shouldn't have to plant churches for Muslim background believers when, if there's already churches there. Church, uh, missionaries shouldn't have to plant churches for night entertainers. These are singers, dancers, prostitutes, so forth, for those or those struggling with substance abuse uh, if there were already churches there. But churches have blind spots. Churches have biases. Sometimes the churches need help. Um, I remember back in 2004, we, we had arrived in Baguio, and I was talking with some of, the, some of the pastors there, and the pastors were kind of complaining that there's all these um, Filipino Muslims moving to Baguio from the, from the south. Of course, they're moving the, up to Baguio because Baguio is a safe place. Southern Philippines is not very safe. And so they're, they're trying to move to a safer place. But the pastors were very frustrated that they're moving in, and it's like they're going to take over and turn this into an Islamic state. Um, I think I annoyed some people at that time because I said, you should be thanking God, not going, oh, my God, about this, because it's a great opportunity. You don't have to go to them. They're coming to you. Uh, and I will say that 20 years later, thing, attitudes have changed a lot. Um, many of the churches and ministries up in Baguio work, uh, specifically work with Muslims and Muslim converts to Christ. Although uh, Sally and I uh, run a counseling center to help church members with count in counseling 
church families, pastors, and missionaries, we see our primary role as a training center. A lot of the churches are not that good at pastoral counseling, uh, uh, but they can be. The church is meant to be a place for holistic healing. But many have not been trained. Now, the Smiths, they train up uh, Christian leaders to reach out to the uh, great urban centers of the world. Um, this all is a parenting role. In a parent, what does a parent do? A parent trains, inspires, motivates, and mobilizes with the intent of passing things on to others. Parents do not live forever, neither do missionaries. If they do not train up others to take over, what was done will die away. And so that's the second role, uh, serving where the church ha has not as parents, training up the churches to take over. Uh, the third is serving where the church <clears throat> cannot now, there's, 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 a, there's a bit of overlap here. Let's be honest with it. Uh, it's hard to say what a church cannot do versus what it can but has not. But I'll give you an example. Uh, for years, when we got to the Philippines, we started out doing medical missions. And we would work with local churches. Uh, local churches could not do medical missions. They didn't have medical doctors. They didn't have dentists. They didn't have surgeons. They didn't have nurses. They did not have access to pharmaceuticals. They did not have the finances to reach out to hundreds of their neighbors. Um, now, we as a parachurch uh, ministry at that time, we could do all of that. But there were a lot of things that we could not do. Um, as outsiders, uh, we needed the local church to work with the community leaders, the Brongai captains, the uh, elementary school principals, so forth, to make arrangements for the mission. We needed them to help us know what they really needed so we could tailor our ministry to their specific context. Um, we needed them to invite their neighbors, and most importantly, we needed them to take over afterwards doing follow-up, setting up Bible studies, uh, providing ministries to the people that have been reached in that event. Serving God where the church cannot uh, makes us not really pioneers, and not really parents, but rather partners. Um, I teach at Philippine Baptist Theological Seminary, mostly missions courses, and Aaron Smith, uh, he teaches at Asia Theological Seminary, ATS, uh, also missions. Celia supervises uh, an accredited chaplaincy program. Uh, so seminaries, counseling centers, accreditation organizations, and other NGOs, non-government organizations, serve as partners for churches doing things that they may not be able to do themselves, coming alongside. These also include Christian publishing houses, Bible translators, radio ministries, mission hospitals, and more. And so if we look at all these three, uh, missionaries serve where the church is not. They do that as pioneers, uh, where the church has not as parents and the church cannot as partners. Let's see if you got this right now, okay? Uh, so we, the missionaries serve where the church is not. How do they serve as? Pioneers. Pioneers. Okay, I heard that. Um, not very loud. You could have done louder. Uh, or where the church has not. What, how do they serve as? Parents. Parents, okay. And what the church cannot? Partners. Partners, okay, that works. So how does that relate to everyone else here? I just said everyone's a missionary, and I'm talking about people going to the other side of the world, and you're not over there. You're here. So uh, there's a couple ways we, we can look at this where everybody, every Christian, every follower of Christ is a missionary. First of all, is the relationship to what, to what uh, we and others are doing elsewhere? And that's, that's important, so I don't want to leave that unsaid. Um, when you send, of course, finances or goods to missionaries or mission organizations, you are involved in the mission's effort. You are a sender or supporter. When you help a missionary on furlough or when they're back home, uh, you are a welcomer. When you send emails, letters, care packages and such, you are an encourager. Uh, when you pray for missionaries, you are a prayer warrior. And when you provide oversight of what is being done through reviewing reports or even during uh, doing field visits, you serve as an accountability uh, partner. These are all vital. But I want to focus on a different aspect of, of a Christian as a missionary. 
Um, as missionaries, uh, whenever we talk about missions, we always start with a great commission, okay? And, of course, there are multiple great commissions in the Bible. There's at least five, I guess, five or six. And uh, the most well-known ones are in Matthew 28 and in Acts 1. And so I'd like to look at those here. Uh, Matthew 28, uh, 19 through 21, it says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, I've been to a lot of missions services, and almost always when I am there, they say it, they say it something like this, Go, therefore, and make disciples. And that sounds, and I'm not a yeller, so that's, that's about as I'm going to get. But, uh, but, but a lot of them will yell it, okay? And, um, but it's kind, of, it's kind of wrong. That's not really how it goes, okay? It, um, I, used to, I used to know a little bit of Greek. I forgot almost all of it. One thing I do remember was that in this particular verse, that's not really what's being said. It's because the focus is not on the going, the focus is on discipling, uh, and a, probably a, a, um, it's not a better translation, but maybe a clearer translation uh, would be not so much go and make disciples, but more like make disciples wherever you go. And of course, that takes into a different picture because all of a sudden that becomes something for everybody because all of us go somewhere, right? Um, the other verse is uh, Acts 1.8, the, the mo other most popular version of the Great Commission. And uh, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus was saying, be my witnesses, um, sent out ones. Uh, and you... So how to be witnesses? Well, first of all, back home. So that would, that would, for them, that would be Jerusalem, uh, be, 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 be Christ's witnesses. A nearby Judea, be Christ's witnesses. In Samaria, and I like to think of Samaria as those neighbors that we're not always totally comfortable with. Do you have neighbors you're not totally comfortable with? Is it just me? Okay. Well, for, for people like me, sometimes there are neighbors that I, that I find, a little, find a little annoying. Um, and, and, and those are kind of the Samarit, Samaritans, you know. If you remember, uh, James and John asked Jesus if, if he would give them permission to call down fire to destroy a, a Samar Samaritan village. So there's an issue there, right? So anyway, but it says, anywhere, everywhere, even to the ends of the earth, be Christ's witnesses. In both of those verses, if you look at it, you realize that the, there's less emphasis on where it's done, way over there or over here. The emphasis on what is done, serving as a witness to the lost and a discipler of new followers of Christ. So let's parallel what I talked about earlier, where the church is not, has not, cannot, and apply that. How would that make sense right here? Okay, first of all, we s serve God where Spring Hill is not. So here in the in Rutgersville area, there are lots of churches. For most people, a church is within a short car ride. However, for many of you, when you start a Bible study or do a backyard Bible club or whatever ty type of ministry in your own neighborhood, in a very real sense, uh, you are bringing the church into your neighborhood in a meaningful, um, accessible way. One might call this a, a kind of Jerusalem or Judean missions. Or one may reach out to people who do not feel as if there's a church for them. Um, our Sumerian missions. Uh, the impoverished or the homeless, the documented or undocumented migrants, uh, Muslims, Hindus, people of other faiths, international college students, 
people in hospices, special needs individuals, those with sens who are sensory impaired, those whose jobs make them unavailable on Sundays, shut-ins, and more. There are people who, in one way or another, the church has missed. Uh, you, can, you can be a pioneer in your community to these people. If there's not that sort of diversity, maybe you're in one of those uh, you know, neighborhoods where there's no diversity, everybody just seems just like you, and that's, that's okay. But probably the next neighborhood over, it's different. Check, out, check your next neighborhood. Or perhaps everyone, is, there's, there's none of that there. Well, then you can pray. You can pray that people of other races, ethnicities, languages, religions, or legal status would move into your neighborhood. Now, some of your neighbors might not like that, but I, but I tell you a secret. You don't have to tell people what you pray about, okay? So, um, we can serve God where Spring Hill has not. Spring Hill has many, many wonderful ministries, but many, if not most of them, were started by one or two people taking on a ministry, building it up, inspiring others, and training the church to embrace this new form of service, of the ministries that are now deeply ingrained in the church's DNA. And you can list more of them than I can, but obviously we have Hope for Appalachia, we have Spring Fling, Trick or Trunk, and many more, two or three major ones at Christmas time. There was a time when these were not done. I, we were here when Trick or Trunk just started, I know, for example. Uh, Hope for Appalachia had not started here yet. And so, um, but one or two members embraced that role and ran with it. Um, I pray that God will inspire some of you to open up your, our church to new and great things. Uh, we can serve God where Spring Hill cannot. Sometimes you are in a unique position, uh, perhaps because of vocation, maybe because of skills, maybe because of access uh, to certain things. Uh, or settings uh, that the church doesn't have access to. Uh, we have people in Spring Hill who have special, uh, who have had special ministries that were due to distance, specialization, or other barriers um, the church couldn't do, but they were able to do, and as such became an outreach of the church. And that's not bad. Each of us are part of the church, an extension of the church, and a partner of the church. Look around to see if God has placed you in a unique place to serve where Spring Hill cannot. Missions where the church is not, has not, or cannot is important. But so is missions where Spring Hill Baptist is not, has not, or cannot. I'm hoping you'll pray that God will lead you into one or more of these ministries, uh, categories of missions, whether pioneer, parent, or partner, all Christians are missionaries. Now, if you believe that God is speaking to you in some way about Christian missions, actually, Sally and I will be around here after, after the service, and we're happy to talk to you. Now, I'm going to say that with a little bit of a caveat. We might not be the best people to talk to, okay? And, be, and it's not, not, we're not trying to turn you away, okay? But, but truthfully, uh, the best people to talk to might be your families or your Bible, people in your Bible study or small group or your ministry team or the pastoral staff or the deacons, because they're the ones who know you the best and can encourage and empower in what and when and where to serve. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time. We thank you for um, that you are on mission for God. And for, you're on mission, and you invite us to join you in that mission. Give us wisdom in how to do that, when to do it, and how to support each other in that process. In Christ's name, amen. Bill, stay here. Sell, sell you if you'll just come up real quick. Okay. Bill Fekishazi, would you come up here, please? I'm going to ask you to pray over Bob and Celia. The whole church is going to pray with Bill, uh, but they're headed back overseas, um, and we will continue to pray for them, support them, communicate with them. Bill Fekishazi is a missionary See. right here in this area, See. and he has also traveled internationally. After Bill prays for them, uh, we will then end with our uh, closing song. Would everybody please stand up? Just focus on praying for Bob and Celia Munson. Bill, here you go. If you'll pray for them, just a ongoing prayer for some food. So I'm going to lay my hand. If y'all would just lay your hands out like we're laying our hands on Bob and Celia. Father God, thank you so much for this day, for Bob and Celia and their mission, Father. 
the work that they do, the time that we shared together in Londrina, Brazil, the love that we shared, the hope, the peace, the mission work that we did, the seed that we planted. Father, that's what mission work's all about, is that seed to plant for others to come to know your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for all you do in our lives. Thank you for our service, for the words that Bob had today, Father, the hope and encouragement that he brings to the missionaries in the field. Father, we love you. We praise you. We ask that you be with us throughout this day. In these things we pray. Amen.
you for being a part of the in-person and online worship service. I'm going to highlight the top three as I do that. Uh, an associate pastor with an emphasis in youth ministry search team member by the name of Kevin Frith is going to come on up here. So, Kevin, if you'll step on up here, all right. He's just going to give us an update. Here's the top three. We want you to serve. Part of Christianity is serving. Uh, it, it's giving. It's an enjoying relationships. And that happens even more as we serve uh, Christ with somebody coming alongside. You can visit our website, and you can see where you can take a little assessment and let us know some of your strengths, let us know some of your abilities. When you do that, you're not signing up to serve. You're just kind of letting us get to know you a little bit and how you're wired and how you're created and what you might enjoy participating in. And then you can also visit the website and find out where there are places to serve, that where you fit in. And people see us up on the stage and they see people out in front and think, well, I can't do that. You need to know. There is a whole lot that takes place during the week as God does things in, in and through this church that you never see. Uh, and God is on the move in mighty ways. So that's the top three. Kevin Frith, who is a member here and a part of the associate pastor search team, he's going to give us an update, and then he's going to close us in prayer. Keep in mind Spring Fest. We want you to participate in that. We want you to enjoy that. Kevin, thank you for your time. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so just, yeah, just to give you a brief update on kind of where we are right now. Um, first of all, thank you so much for all your prayers as we go through this process. Um, we, um, we really appreciate it, and we can feel it um, through our meetings and as we um, interview candidates. Um, so um, our team meets uh, once a week, uh, usually on Mondays, and uh, we've been doing that since the beginning of the year, roughly uh, around the first of the year. Uh, we put the uh, advertisement out, and we've had a lot of responses to it. Um, we've had, um, we've had uh, I'm not sure how many people have actually applied for it, but we have interviewed um, or actually reviewed um, 25 uh, to 30 uh, applications, um, and we have been having uh, weekly interviews since that time, just about. Um, so like I said, we meet on Monday evenings, uh, either in person or we're interviewing somebody. Um, and we, we have actually moved forward uh, in the process a, a little bit. Um, we have three candidates that now we have moved past the first round interview. Um, and so we are heading into the second uh, interview for them. And we plan to, um, as we move forward in the process here, we plan to uh, connect with our youth ministry leadership team uh, to ha to um, just discover ways how we can integrate um, this new staff hire when when we make the hire um, into uh, their already uh, thriving team. Um, and uh, we just ask that you continue to pray for us through the process as we hopefully will just continue um, to move forward here. Um, so we um, have a verse, uh, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 is what we've been praying through this entire process. And um, that says, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. So um, let me close us in a prayer with a prayer that I've kind of uh, been praying myself through this process. Um, and uh, so if, if we can pray, Father God, thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you for always being there for us, where, whether good times or bad. Thank you for this church and what it means to each of us and our community. I pray, Lord, that you would guide us in our search for a new uh, associate pastor with emphasis on youth, and I pray that you would provide clarity to the search team and that we would allow you to make the ultimate decision. The, our youth are, essential, are an essential part to our church, and I pray for the right person to come along, and I pray for all this in your precious name. Amen. And Lord, thank you for all for coming today, and I pray for Spring Fest to be a wonderful thing. Have a great day. Life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, oh boy, I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll 
fly away to a land where joy shall never end. Fly.